my name is Lin Sang. Um, this is actually my fifth time speak at All Saints Open. Really excited to be here. I've actually lived in Raleigh for a very long time. Oh gosh, almost 25 years, I think. Um, so I'm a director of open source at solo.io, uh, which is on my shirt. Um, I joined Solo about almost three years ago, and uh, I've been a very long time contributor in the Istio project. Sorry, the headset seems a little bit odd. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I've been working on the Istio, made tons of contribution, was one of the founding uh, TOC and steering committee member in the Istio project. I wrote two books about Istio. Um, we're actually going to have a book signing right after this session in the third floor lobby. So if you're interested in getting to learn a little bit more about Ambient, uh, definitely grab one of my books at the book signing. It's completely free. Um, a little bit fun fact about me is um, I, I used to work at IBM. I worked at IBM for 19 years. I was a senior technical staff member at IBM. And right before I um, decided to join Solo, the last day when I was at IBM, I went to the corporate directory. I took a screenshot of myself in the corporate directory of how many patent applications I contributed to IBM. And back then, uh, there was 20, uh, 207 patents uh, that uh, I contributed to IBM that has my name as the co-inventor, but IBM owns all their patents now. Um, a little bit about our company. By the way, how many of you heard of Solo.io? Uh, yeah, wow, a lot of you. Thank you. I'm actually really impressed. That's how um, our company was founded in 2017 by Edith Loving, uh, who is my boss. If you haven't heard of our company, it's very well founded. Uh, we had uh, 1 billion acquisition, uh, I'm sorry, not acquisition. <laughs> I guess we were dreaming about acquisition one day. Uh, we had a 1 billion uh, valuation, I believe was uh, almost two years ago. And we have a lot of uh, leaders in the open source community. Uh, recently, we had one of the founders of Istio, Louis Ryan, join us at Solo. Uh, one thing I really love about Solo uh, as a company is we offer free workshops. So if you scan that QR code, uh, you'll be able to uh, run workshops completely free uh, to learn Istio, Ambient, Envoy, uh, eBPF, Solium. So all these are completely for free for you. Well, we provide an uh, environment in the cloud to allow you to go through uh, different learning on these uh, projects. All right, uh, let's... Folks, back to talk about Istio. So um, about a year ago, September 7 last year, it was a very special day for the Istio community because we launched something called Istio Ambient Mesh. What exactly is the Istio Ambient Mesh? So the easiest way to think about it is the new data play mode uh, we introduced in Istio without requiring you as a user to run sidecars. So uh, if we published a blog to introduce why uh, we, we decided to launch Istio Ambient. As you can see, uh, it was mainly from Google and contributor from Solo uh, leading this effort uh, back then. Um, so let's start with why we introduced this uh, new data play mode called Ambient in the Istio community. Over the past five years, as our user increase in the Istio community, community to adopt Istio, we noticed one of the main challenges with the sidecar is it requires injection of the sidecar, right? Uh, as you onboard your applications into the mesh, you always have to drag a little bit of luggage with your application. And unfortunately, that luggage is not the same luggage as you drag in your airport because that luggage uh, sidecar always have some CVE. Uh, security vulnerabilities that you require you to constantly upgrade them. It's not as same as you upgrade your wardrobe. You actually have to kind of restart your whole application to pick up a newer version of the sidecar. Uh, the other challenge we noticed when working with a uh, sidecar from our user is 
a lot of applications already have their sidecar, and sometimes they have sequence issues between their sidecar with Istio sidecar, so that actually prevents them onboarding their application into Istio. Um, and we talk about sidecar upgrade, it's a, such a pain that you always have to kind of making sure you uh, restart your application at the right timing. You have to make sure you have the right high availability for your application to not causing any downtime. Um, and there are also additional limitation with the sidecar model. Uh, for instance, a lot of the user wants to use Istio to get visibility into their Kubernetes jobs. And with sidecar, we don't support Kubernetes jobs because the moment when your job finished, the sidecar is still running and it's not great, right? Because the job's finished when the job uh, finishes. Uh, we also don't support uh, server sent first protocols. This could be your, uh, an issue if your database like MySQL requires server sent uh, first protocol, then we won't allow you to be able to successfully onboard in your application into the service mesh. The second challenge with the sidecar is incremental adoption. So the sidecar is there uh, for you regardless what function you need uh, from Istio. For example, you may only need a mutual TLS from the service mesh. In fact, that's uh, a lot of what use the most common feature of Istio. Uh, is they, their security team come to them to say, hey, I really need mutual TLS between all your internal uh, service communications, and what's the easiest way to do that? That's uh, from a service mesh to have something, a control plane um, provided like Istio to manage that certificate, to manage that uh, certificate rotation for you. Uh, so you don't have to do it manually to make sure your communication is upgraded for end-to-end -end security, right? So the challenge with this though is, what if the user only wants to adopt Istio for mutual DLS or for some other basic function that doesn't require layer seven processing, right? Uh, with sidecar, unfortunately, you have to drag the whole sidecar with you even though you just come to Istio for mutual TLS. There are also additional challenges with sidecars. Um, so the first challenge I would say is uh, the sidecar resource in the Istio community is not one of the, it's not one of the most intuitive resources. You will have to learn that resource, unfortunately, if you deploy Istio in production in slightly larger scale. The reason is by default, everything has visibility into everything else from a sidecar perspective, uh, and which can cause your sidecar memories grow as you deploy more services, you deploy more uh, Istio resources into your Kubernetes cluster. So sidecar resource was introduced by the Istio community in Istio 1.1 to make sure your sidecar uh, configuration can be isolated um, to prune out the unnecessary resources or workloads that's not relevant to your workload. Um, so that's something you have to learn as you have a larger scales. Um, the other thing is uh, the sidecar tends to over provision resources uh, because uh, we have default uh, CPU and memory uh, re requests and uh, sometimes you don't need that many resources. So it's hard, it's very hard to make sure you actually have the right resource CPU memory configuration for your particular workload. And sidecar sometimes are complicated to operate uh, due to some of the reasons we outlined earlier uh, to you always have to um, making sure you sizing for your sidecar resources during upgrades. You make sure you have to um, think through the uh, the rollout uh, during upgrade to, without downtime. So uh, that the, all these challenges with sidecar uh, leads us to design Istio ambient service mesh. Uh, so essentially, uh, it's sidecar list without sidecar uh, data plane in Istio. Uh, what's really interesting about ambient is we slicing the layers uh, into two. Remember we talked about sidecar, one of the challenges with sidecar is there's no incremental adoption. 
if you just need neutral DRS, you still have to pay for the entire cycle uh, coming with layer seven processing. So what Ambient does is uh, we believe uh, it's more efficient to have a layer seven to be shared um, on that particular node that provide the zero trust tunnel. So you could potentially have multiple application share the same uh, layer, uh, layer four processing. And then for layer seven processing, we believe it's more tenant scoped. Um, so we have a waypoint proxy handle that that's specifically designed based on the tenant scope you feel comfortable, whether it's service account or whether it's namespace, because we don't believe Envoy is designed for uh, multi-tenancy. We don't believe it's secure to be able to handle multi-tenancy for layer seven processing. Uh, it has a bunch of issues such as security, noise, neighbor, cost the control uh, associated with layer seven processing uh, for multi-tenancy. So Ambient was uh, introduced uh, last, uh, about a year ago in September, and in Istio 1.18, it reaches alpha, um, also in 1.19, and right now we're actively discussing how do we make Ambient to beta so that we can recommend it's production ready for our user. Oh, um, the key benefit of Ambient, uh, number one, is simplified operation. Uh, the reason is there's no sidecar, so there's no luggage for you, for your application to drag along, so you don't have to restart um, your application whenever there is a CVE, whether it's on the layer four layer or whether it's on the layer seven layer, uh, it's completely outside of your application. Cost reduction, we've done a bunch of study on this. Uh, we find uh, with ambient, uh, it can save your service mesh cost, data plane costs particularly to up to 90% or even more. Uh, so we're gonna share a little bit more on that. The third goal, um, which I leave as the third, because I think that's the least important goal, um, is improved performance, particularly for the layer four, where you only need a uh, service mesh just for the layer four functions, such as uh, layer four telemetry, uh, mutual PRS, we believe it's going to improve performance, uh, given uh, the Z-Tunnel, it's so much more light, lightweight compared with uh, Envoy proxy. So let's dig into a little bit more on the Z tunnel, which provides the layer four functionality uh, in ambient of its architecture. So essentially, Z tunnel handles uh, handles all the workflows inside of ambient for that particular node. What Z tunnel does is uh, it takes care of uh, the key and certificates. Uh, provisioning, uh, ask, uh, talk with the Istio control plane to mint the certificates, and then upgrade the connection to mutual TLS as the client and server establish connections outside of the, outside of the node. Uh, the other thing Zitano does is enforce policies and provide layer for telemetry information. So as you can see, it's shared, it's per node uh, Zitano. So let's dive into a little bit into how the Z-Tunnel architecture works. Can you guys see in the back? Uh, is it a little bit small? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to enlarge this, but feel free to move to a little bit front row um, to be able to see the screen well if you have trouble in the back, because there's plenty of seats. Um, so essentially, the first step is uh, Z-Tunnel is acting as an XDS client. It's going to establish the connection to the ACO control plane on 15.0.12 and ask, hey, can I get my XDS configuration? Uh, the ACO control plane is going to look at the, uh, the request to make sure it's uh, valid, uh, it's the right, it has the right token for the Z tunnel, and then hand out to say, hey, this is your workload the XDS configuration. And then Zitano is also act as a certificate authority client and going to ask uh, Istio control plane, give me the certs uh, to represent workload uh, application A, which is part of the ambient. And then Istio D is going to say, check, are you allowed to represent uh, application A? If you are allowed, here are the signed certificates. 
As a community, uh, we actually started uh, implementing ZTunnel using Envoy Proxy, and uh, pre, uh, we pre-program Envoy Proxy for multi-tenancy for layer four functionality initially. Uh, essentially, SCOD generates Envoy configuration and send very large XDS configuration to Envoy as a ZTunnel, uh, and then Envoy based on what uh, the control plane tells uh, the configuration to execute the configuration. So there's a challenge with that. Envoy configuration was not meant for people. It's really meant for machines. How many of you can understand Envoy configuration? Feels confidently that uh, you know what it's doing. Raises your hand. All right. <laughs> not surprisingly, um, this is one talk uh, Rob Salmon in the Istio community uh, gave two years ago. That shows like the complexity of the Envoy configuration. Uh, it's really like from cluster listeners uh, and security configuration. It's a lot. Endpoints. Uh, it's a lot to digest. But in fact, if you envision uh, a, a simple way to think about it is if you have just three or five workloads in the mesh, you have probably 10, over 10,000 lines of runway configuration just for three to five workloads in the service mesh. That's how complex it is for runway configuration. So as a community, uh, we start to think about is runway the right proxy for ZTunnel? That was the proxy uh, for Z for ZTunnel a year ago when we first launched Ambient, we start to think about what if we just send the absolute necessary configuration from the Istio control plane to uh, the ZTunnel, would that save a lot of cost for the user, right? Because of some of the user pay for bandwidth. And also uh, the ZTunnel has to kind of hold, store all these configurations somewhere, whether it's in memory, I think it's in memory, so that would potentially increase uh, CPU and memory. Um, so we start to look at, do we really need to send that many info, uh, configuration to ZTunnel? What does ZTunnel really, really need? So we start to think about, okay, it definitely need the co-located workload information, right? So the name of the workload, the protocol, uh, the, protocol the namespace, service account, status, nodes, does it speak uh, edge ball? If you're not familiar with edge ball, uh, the communication between uh, the source and the target Z tunnel and also to the waypoint are uh, upgraded to uh, HTTP overnight, uh, overnight network. Um, so it's essentially HTTP, so you can think about it as HTTP2 uh, with uh, encryption mutual TLS tunnel. Um, so it's important to understand uh, whether the workload itself will speak edge ball or whether the workload relies on ZTunnel to upgrade to speak uh, edge ball. Does it have waypoint proxies? Uh, does it have any layer 4 policies? Because ZTunnel also enforces layer 4 policies. And what are the corresponding service information for the workload, right? Is that sufficient? Actually, no, because ZTunnel has to communicate to workloads outside of the node as well. So, it, in fact, it has to know all the workload information in uh, your Kubernetes cluster, whether it's in the mesh or outside of mesh. So, it has to know all that information. Um, so, at the end, we kind of design our ZTunnel con configuration to be very simple based on exactly what we need. Uh, how many of you feel like you, you can actually understand this configuration? All right, right? It's really simple, right? It's workload, the workload IP, right? What protocol it's speaking, the name, namespace, service account, all that stuff we talk about, and the authorization policies, right? Really, really simple. So the moment you label your workload, uh, the, you label your namespace where your workload runs to say, hey, I want to participate into Ambient, then we kind of flip that protocol from TCP to Edgebone, right? Because that moment, uh, ZTunnel uh, would, would know this is the one I want to upgrade the connection to speak to Edgebone. And this is on the right side, it's an example of the policy, right? It's also very simple, humanly readable. It says we have a, uh, we have a hello world viewer policy and it's applied 
to the default namespace and uh, it's uh, it's just basically allowed this particular service account which is sleep to access hello world so uh, very simple uh, to be able to attach a policy in the workload configuration so th this much simplified workload DS uh, XDS configuration really are much so much simple to read and debugging and uh, it's so much less uh, resources uh, network bandwidth from Istio control plane to you know generate the XDS configuration and then to send to Z tunnel so we believe it's definitely going to reduce your network cost if you have to pay for uh, the the level bandwidth between the control plane and Z tunnel. Um, so when we started implementing Z tunnel initially, uh, it was Envoy, right? So when we decided to rewrite the Z tunnel, we actually tried uh, GoLand first, and uh, it wasn't super lightweight. Uh, we also looked at it into C++, which is what Envoy used, and we landed on Rust because it's very high performance. It has a very low resource utilization. It has some of the popular proxy out there. It's written in Rust, so it's very battle test. Um, it can also support work stealing very easily. So uh, that's a very important decision when we're looking at using Rust because Envoy, it's very hard for Envoy to support work stealing, and work stealing is what uh, can really make a difference when you have a uh, um, a proxy that you can potentially still work from other um, other threads. In fact, uh, John, one of uh, my co-maintainers in the community, actually run uh, some tests on how efficient a Z tunnel can be, um, and he did a large, really large scale of uh, pseudo test uh, with uh, 200k pods and Z tunnel was only 500 RAM uh, and start up in just a second. So that shows how efficient the new Z tunnel in Rust is. Um, all right, so Z tunnel uh, it implements layer four function. What about layer seven function, right? Um, a lot of you probably using service mesh for resilience functions, for traffic shifting, traffic routing to uh, enforce uh, security policy that's layer seven, not just simple uh, access control, much more rich access control based on maybe your job token or maybe based on your methods. Um, so that's what Waypoint is for. So for Waypoint, we decided we're going to continue reuse Envoy because Envoy is the best proxy, um, handle layer seven proxy out there. It's a CNCF graduated project. Um, so as you can see, uh, Waypoint has two scope. Um, the default scope is uh, the namespace. So that particular Waypoint can manage all the workload for that particular namespace. In this case, it's the S namespace. Um, but really what's uh, comfortable based on your tenancy requirement, right? If you feel like namespace is uh, not granular enough, you could also run Waypoint per service account. In this case, it would be a dedicated waypoint just for your S1 service account. Um, you can simply deploy your waypoint proxy using Istio Cardo commands. Uh, the only thing difference uh, from the other gateway uh, resources is the gateway class name needs to be Istio Waypoint. And, uh, um, and then it listens on the edge phone port, which is 15008. Um, and uh, if you don't specify anything, that's deploy a, a, a waypoint for the namespace scope. If you do specify which uh, service account it's for, then it's your nose to deploy a waypoint just for your particular service account you specified. So a little bit dive into how waypoint uh, works. Uh, in this case, uh, as a user, you would uh, use uh, either KubeCardo Cube, Cube or IstioCardo uh, to create that gateway resource that uses Istio Waypoint as a class name and then deploy it to your Kubernetes cluster. You tell us what scope of your waypoint is. And then Istio D also act as a waypoint controller. Uh, it monitors the waypoint resources and auto-deploy the waypoint proxy 
based on the gateway resource, uh, declarative of gateway resources, you tell us to do. And then once the waypoint uh, is deployed, the waypoint proxy, which is essentially an envoy proxy, would establish connection to your Istio control plane on port 15012 and ask, hey, this is my Istio token. Can I get my search signed? Um, and then the control plane is going to say, your token is valid, and here are your signed certificates. And then the waypoint proxy is going to get the XDS configuration. Um, and then control plane would give uh, back the XDS uh, configuration in Envoy. So that's essentially how the waypoint proxy works. It works very closely like the sidecar proxy configuration. The only difference is uh, it has a little bit more complicated uh, code to handle the double edge bone um, decryption and encryption. All right, so also back to the drawing board, we started to think about how do we simplify the waypoint configuration uh, in the Istio community, right? So um, if you look at the Envoy as a sidecar, uh, one of the challenges I highlighted earlier was the uh, sidecar resources to help the sidecar to trim unnecessary configuration. Um, so that's typically by you as a user learning how to use the sidecar resources. Uh, you apply export to annotation to your services, you apply sidecar resources, to make sure you can only see, uh, have access to the necessary configuration you need. So a lot of learning on the user side to be able to do that. Um, so this is so effectively, I want to use this diagram to explain to you how the sidecar resources works, right? So the moment you as a service producer, in this case, uh, it's the RAD uh, service, right? Uh, the moment it applies the uh, annotation that says, I'm only export my service to uh, the current namespace and the Istio ingress namespace. That's going to reduce uh, the configuration of the red on the namespace two for purple and blue sidecar. And then as a service consumer side, if you apply uh, the, the sidecar resource to say, you know, I want to control my egress traffic to only goes to Istio system and also my current uh, namespace, which is namespace one, that effectively eliminate additional configurations on the namespace one's uh, two sidecars, right? So that's how you trim the configuration uh, in the world of sidecar to make sure your Envoy proxy only gets the absolutely re minimum required configuration. So it's not very straightforward. You could do the same thing on the namespace two by apply consumer and producer side. So that's effectively the, the end result of trimming configurations. Um, so we look at how do we simplify this way for waypoint, right? You're learning all these annotation, apply sidecar resources, not the most intuitive thing to do, right? So, um, for Waypoint, we start to think about, uh, do we add support for sidecar and export to in Waypoint, right? We didn't really like that user experience we introduced for our user, and which is why we decided to introduce destination-only Waypoint, right? By doing destination-only Waypoint, one thing really cool is your Waypoint proxy is only aware of what it's going to connect to, which is the the services and workloads it manages. So in this case, it effectively reduced um, the configuration of Waypoint by not aware of anything else in the Kubernetes cluster, but focusing on the destinations, uh, cluster, endpoint, and routes, and all the other configuration only related to the Waypoint it's managing to. So envision you have a thousand workloads and services in your cluster, and your waypoint maybe only manage two of them. So in that case, your waypoint would only be aware of the two um, workloads and services, cluster, endpoints, and routes, and blah, 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 that configuration. So this effectively eliminates the need for you to config sidecar and export two for all the other 998 uh, configuration uh, services and uh, workloads. Um, 
So this diagram is supposed to show you uh, the table, how waypoint configuration by default is going to help you by using a simple example of uh, if you have this uh, red, uh, yellow, purple, blue, uh, namespace one and two, right? Each namespace has uh, 25 deployments with 10 paths. Uh, just increase a little bit more to the scale, then you will see the saving. Then each waypoint deploy with two paths, right? In this case, uh, with sidecar, you, if you don't trim the configuration, you are going to end up with 12, uh, 1,500 um, um, configurations on each of the Envoy. Um, with Waypoint, uh, by default, with each of the namespace, because the Waypoint only care about the configuration that it manages, which is 25. So uh, for each of the Waypoints, you are going to, actually the total of the Waypoint is going to have uh, 100 configuration, where the sidecar would have uh, 12,500. So that's more than 100% um, smaller, right? 0.8% uh, configuration wise from the Waypoint to the sidecars. So the, which would translate to a lot of saving for you as you need to run, um, run this configuration inside of your Envoy proxy. Um, all right, policy enforcement is also one of the key function in service mesh, right? One of the challenge with a sidecar though is some of the policy are enforced on the source side and some of the policy are enforced on the destination side. For example, how many of you use uh, Istio routes configuration before virtual services? Okay, uh, not many. Um, so if you ever use the route configuration in Istio, uh, it's on the source side. Uh, so when you troubleshooting um, whether your route configuration is not working, you have to make sure it's looking at the Envoy blocks for the source side. If you're troubleshooting authorization policy, you have to look at uh, your Envoy configuration on the destination side. So this may be intuitive for people in the Istio community for a long time, but for new users come to Istio, they're always very, very frustrated because they don't understand which policy is enforced on which side. But by moving a uh, destination-only waypoint, we effectively have policy only enforced on the destination. So whenever there's a problem, you can just look at the waypoint logs because you have to think out whether it's source side or destination side. What if you have a mixed environment? In the cases where your client may be inside of the mesh or maybe some of your client is outside of the mesh. Uh, in this case, if you have policy enforced on the client side, uh, in the sidecar, you would not be able to have that policy enforced, right? Because the client side doesn't have sidecar. Uh, when you run Waypoint though, because the policy is always enforced on the destination side, so regardless whether your client is inside of the mesh or outside of the mesh, you can always have your policy enforced. So that's really, really cool. Um, you might be wondering, what if I need to reach out to external services? Uh, so uh, we are still design egress waypoints uh, to allow you to have traffic control if you need to control access to like AWS, maybe Lamba service, or maybe Google Cloud metadata services. Um, so you can control which of your workloads can access which uh, services. That's under control, but we do expect it's coming. Now I want to spend a minute to talk about resource savings because they are very, very important uh, for business decision makers. Uh, we've done a bunch of study on resource savings. Uh, we started initially with smaller deployments uh, with just uh, like 30, uh, 30 pods. In this case, what we find out is uh, if you just need a uh, service mesh ambient, it's still ambient for layer four functionality. Uh, we've we've noticed 90% uh, saving on layer four. And if you need, uh, it, it's still ambient for layer four and layer seven, it's 75% saving. So that's uh, saving compared with when you run the same workload uh, with sidecars. 
over the months, we actually increased our workload uh, to uh, 50 services and 150 pods. And in this model, we also find out continuous saving, actually more saving when you have more workloads. Uh, so as you can see, we find 90% saving for layer four and layer seven, uh, compared with MDN to sidecar. And we find 98% of saving if you just uh, use layer four functionality from MDN to compare with sidecar. And that is comparison between uh, the CPU and memory that's needed between uh, the, Z, the Z tunnel, by the way, Z tunnel stands, stands for Zero Trust Tunnel, to and uh, Z tunnel to the sidecar uh, for layer four and Z tunnel and waypoint uh, for layer four and seven, uh, comparing with sidecars. So a lot of savings for that. Uh, you might be wondering, what about sidecars, right? Sidecar, if you're using sidecar today, how many of you are using sidecar today? All right, a couple of you, very cool. Uh, if you're using sidecar today, uh, rest assured, sidecar are here, stay. I will be part of the Israel project for a very long time. Uh, you may still want to use sidecar in certain cases. For example, you may have source side specific configuration that you want to do a route decision based on source, a particular source label of your source workload. Uh, that's not something Ambient supports at the moment. Uh, you might want a uh, specific configuration on the destination side, uh, which uh, namespace and service account granularity are not enough for you. For example, you might run Wasm plugin resource you want to run just for a particular workload in a service account, but not for any other workload, right? So this is when sidecar could potentially still be very, very useful for you. And then the, at the end, you may not feel comfortable to move to a sidecar list architecture. So you're, you'll still be able to use sidecar for as long as you want. All right, let's uh, summarize quickly. Uh, ambient is the new data play mode. I introduced Istio without sidecar. And Ztunnel, uh, since we initial launch, we've been rewritten Ztunnel in Rust. Uh, it has much reduced configuration, much more lightweight. Uh, it's very high performance. Uh, waypoint is actually optional. So you don't need Waypoint if you don't need the layer 7 processing. You can deploy Waypoint per tenant scope, whether it's namespace or service account, whichever you feel comfortable. Um, and the Waypoint configuration is simple out of box. You don't need the Sidecar Expo 2 configuration uh, if you're familiar with Sidecar today. Uh, we've, we've really designed Ztunnel and Waypoint to scale with very minimum configuration. Uh, with that, I want to see uh, if, uh, I, I think I may have two minutes for questions. Um, and I want to also mention two things. One is the book signing. So I will be at the third floor lobby if you want to get a copy of my ambient book. Um, also, the QR code leads you to the, the solo uh, workshops where you can run workshop with the environment free. So search ambient. Uh, the reason I don't show a demo in this talk is that you can actually do the demo yourself uh, when you go to the uh, the OL Academy site. Uh, you can run MBA, EDPF, and all the other workshops are available completely for free. So uh, feel free to scan that QR code. 